But let's give it up for the worship team today. They've done a fantastic job. Really grateful for them. And again, I definitely want to want to lift up Perla. That was just, it, it takes so much courage to be able to stand up here in front of people and just share about some of the most difficult things you've faced in your life. And I'm uh, so proud of you too, Perla. I don't know where you are right now, but just so proud of you for, for fighting to cling to Jesus in the middle of all that. And I, it's really, really admirable. Uh, but I definitely want to say good afternoon to the whole church. So glad to be here with you guys, especially to those of you that are visiting with us. If you're here maybe for the first time or first couple times, definitely want to extend a warm welcome to you. We're so glad to have you here to worship with us. Um, we love having our friends out. And, uh, and as you can see behind me, we actually are just starting a new, uh, a new series here together in the church. It's called What's Your Story? And, uh, and the point of it is that we're taking some time to look at some different times in the gospel, the different stories specifically in the gospel, where people encountered Jesus for the first time. And how when they encountered Jesus, and, and people came from very, very different backgrounds in those gospels, but when they encountered Jesus... And they came with their own stories, how much Jesus rewrote their story for something even more incredible. And it's been, and it's been great so far. I know Scott kicked us off last week. We're going to be doing this for uh, the rest of the fall. But today, we're actually going to be looking at a man who came to Jesus. He was one of the few people that came to Jesus with very specific expectations. He thought when he met Jesus, he had a good idea of who he was talking to. And his encounter with Jesus was a lot different than he expected. And it's a lot like, and his story is kind of a lot like those of us who have been to church a lot, or maybe been around a lot of Jesus people. You know, you may not have gone to church very much, but you know the Jesus people. You know, you maybe had, a, had one or two friends that were Jesus people. And, uh, and if you've been around church or Jesus people a lot, it can create this expectation or idea of what church is, or what Jesus is like. That probably isn't the right picture. It's kind of a, well, I'll save that. It can also create this weird pressure of how you think you're supposed to act when you're at church or around Jesus people. You know? Especially if you're coming to church maybe for the first time or the first time in a while. That maybe you've like, seen things on TV, or this is kind of your first real church experience, it can create this, like, how am I actually supposed to act like when I'm here? And it can, can look a little, it can make us feel like we got to act like this. Greg, would you like to say grace? Oh, uh, well, uh, Greg's Jewish dad, you know that. You're telling me the Jews don't pray, honey? Unless you have some objection. No, 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 I'd love to. Pam, come on, it's not like I'm a rabbi or something. I said grace in many... A dinner table. That's what I do with my hands. Okay. Oh, dear God. Thank you. You are such a good God to us, a, a kind and gentle and accommodating God and we thank you oh sweet sweet Lord of hosts for the smorgasbord you have so aptly lain at our table this day and each day by day day by day by day Oh, dear Lord, three things we pray. To love thee more dearly, to see thee more clearly, to follow thee more nearly, day by day, by day. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I love that scene. That will always and forever make me laugh. But that, that's kind of how it can feel like sometimes. If you haven't been to church in a while, you show up to church and you're like, what's, what's the, how do I hold my hands? And what are, the, what are the words I'm supposed to say? How am I supposed to act? So on that note, if you are new here, I want to invite you, you can sit in the front row. And we'll have you come up at the end of service. You can introduce yourself and you can say a prayer for all of us at the end of service. <laughs> of course, I'm kidding. 
Uh, but uh, for those of you that don't know me very well, you know, I'm, I'm a minister's kid. You know those PKs. They're a problem, right, Connor? Um, I grew up in church. I grew up around the Bible and uh, was around a lot of churchy people and everything my whole life. And, and I thought from all of this, from all of my life experience, my infinite experience as a, as a preacher's kid, that I had a good picture of who Jesus was, right? I thought I knew what he wanted and even what I would kind of get from this whole church experience. And if I said I wanted to follow him, and when I, when I really met Jesus, when I really started to encounter the Jesus of the Bible, I did not realize how off I was and how much Jesus was going to change my life. The title of our sermon here today, oh, it went ahead, and we'll back it up. There it is. A good man and a good teacher. Let's go ahead and say a prayer. Father, I do just want to thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your presence at your feet right now. Uh, so grateful, God, for, uh, for the love that you have for all of us and the stories that you've given us, God, and how much you want to be a part of our story and, uh, and affect our story. I pray that, that right now, God, you help us to really be humble, to be open to your word. Please speak through me, through your word, God. Uh, please move me out of the way. And I pray that, God, as, as we leave church here today, that, uh, that we will have encountered you in a very special way, that we will see you more clearly and be more nearly, all those things. God, we love you so much. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So today we're going to look at a man in the Bible that's only referred to as the rich young man or the rich young ruler. And I'm going to do something a little bit different today than I normally like to do because he shows up three different in three of the four Gospels in the New Testament. And there's some details in, in kind of each of the Gospels that I want to highlight. So we're not going to just focus in on one set of passages. I'm going to kind of more share the story and we're going to bounce around a little bit between the Gospels while we kind of get the idea of what the story was like, right? So you can just kind of follow along, write notes. Uh, in Mark 10, 17, we're going to start here with the Mark account of this. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And we'll stop there for the moment. So as we meet this character, it's important to note that Jesus is well into his ministry at this point. He'd been preaching for somewhere in the neighborhood between maybe one to two years, give or take. And, uh, and so he was getting, he was pretty well known at the time. People knew who he was. They had heard about him. And so clearly, even by this guy's response, he had heard of Jesus. He had heard of some of the things he was teaching and doing and what he was about. And, uh, and so he ran up to Jesus with a very important question to ask. And at first glance, we, we want to notice a couple of things about this guy. First of all, as he says, he runs up to Jesus and falls on his knees, calls Jesus good teacher, and asks him a question that really begs at the heart of almost any human being on the planet. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What is it going to take to get to heaven? All right, at the core of really all of us is that question. So everything about this guy on, on the surface level, I mean, he says he, he runs up to Jesus. and you're not, You don't run up to somebody unless you think it's important. And he says he falls on his knees before him. When was the last time you fell on your knees before anybody? Yeah. Right? So there's something significant here. First impressions about this guy seem really good. Right? He's doing, he's doing all the right things. He seems to understand who Jesus is uh, on some level. He has a spiritual question to ask. I don't know if you, if you ever really kind of looked at it, but when you looked at the Gospels, most people that came to Jesus, they didn't have like a spiritual question to ask. They came to him with a problem. And we're like, hey, fix this, can you? Right? So this guy's different. He's not coming with a problem that he wants Jesus to fix. He runs up to him on his knees. He's so humble, and he's saying all the things he's supposed to say. And, uh, and, and God, what, Jesus, what do I got to do to get eternal life, to be in heaven? But Jesus responds to him in a very, very interesting way. In the next verse, in verse 18... He responds by saying, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Now, I'm not sure what you would feel if you were this guy. 
Right? You come with a you come with a good question, with a spiritual question. You're calling Jesus something you know admirable and respectful, and then he answers you by not even giving you a straight answer. He answers you with a question. Right? Why do you call me good? Really, what he's doing here is he he's, he's kind of correcting the guy for calling him good. Jesus is correcting this, this guy that's, that's, that's coming with a, with a humble spiritual attitude, and he says, no, 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 don't, don't call me good. Your version of good, don't, don't, don't call me good. You know, Jesus was a master of getting to the heart of people. He knew how to do that in very, very special ways. And what I think he's starting to reveal to us through this man is that this guy had a warped perspective of Jesus, of who he was, and even what he wanted from him. And it wasn't that he was just all wrong. Is it wrong to call Jesus a good teacher? No, he was a good teacher. But there was something about his perspective, something about his understanding about Jesus that was incomplete or, or off. And what, he's, what he said that he wanted is that he wanted eternal life, and he clearly knew that Jesus had some answers, but he was really all wrong in how to get it. And his question, uh, the question that he actually asks him in the Matthew account is he says this. He says, teacher, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? What's, what's the deed? What, what's the act that I got to perform to be with you in heaven forever? Do I got to go to church more often? Stop cussing? Quit day drinking? Give a homeless guy a quarter? What's the deed? What's the act that I got to do in order to be right with you, for, for all things to be wrapped up in good in heaven? And really what he was doing was he was looking for, for a quick to-do. He wanted kind of the magic button, the magic pill of eternal life. And he was saying and doing all the things that he thought Jesus wanted in order to get it. He came in with the with, with all the right words, with the right posture. You know, he was saying all this stuff from his knees. It was kind of like, you know, Ben Stiller trying to think, like, this sounds good, right? This, this is, these, are the, these are the words to say, to see, see thee. You know, that's how you know when you're really trying to be spiritual, when you refer to God as thee, you know? To see thee in, in the most righteous of ways. But then Jesus answers him and completely blows up his version of what good is. When I first started taking my relationship with God seriously, I was a lot like this guy. In many ways, as I'll share more, I, I, I'm very much still like him. But there were things that I wanted from a relationship with God. And I thought I knew how to get them. And I thought I knew what Jesus was looking for in order to get them. What I wanted was I wanted the security of knowing I was going to heaven just like this guy, right? This is a good question. All of us want to know if we're going to heaven, right? You wouldn't be at church if you didn't have that question in you somewhere. Uh, I didn't want to feel guilty for all the sin that I was in. I wanted God to fix my problems. And I wanted to marry a good-looking Christian girl. That's, that's what I was looking for. That's what I wanted for my relationship with God. I got one of those things. And I knew if I, if I wanted these things, okay, there's some good stuff I should be doing. I should read my Bible and pray. You know, I should, I should make sure I'm at church consistently. I need to bring my Bible to church. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's a really good idea. Bring your Bible to church. Try to stay away from bad stuff and just overall just try to be a good person. I even knew a lot of the church people terminology. Like disciple and quiet time. Midweek service. <laughs> Repent. Pagan. Mm. <laughs> I knew all this stuff. I've been hearing it my whole life. And then I started to study the Bible. To really study the Bible. To really start taking a look at what Jesus, who Jesus was in the Bible. And the guys in my life started to show me so many things about Jesus that basically one of the first things that really hit me was that my version of good was wrong. 
My version of good, I was a good person. And my version of good was not God's. I wasn't really a good person. I couldn't really be a good person. And there were never going to be enough good deeds to make me a good person or to get me what I wanted. Good was wrong. And a lot of us, when we come to church or try to really start getting to know Jesus, we kind of have an idea of what we're looking for. And maybe what we think he wants in order to get him. We want good marriages. We want our kids to grow up in a Christian home. Maybe that you see that your life choices have caused a lot of damage. You see the effects that you've had on the people that you care about. And you're like, man, I got, I got to change. I got to do this differently. None of these things are bad. I want to make sure to clarify that. I'm not trying to condemn anybody in here for wanting these things. All these things are good. Wanting to go to heaven is good. But I think the first thing that Jesus really wants to show us is our version of him and what we think he wants is probably wrong. And that's actually a good thing to admit. Because from there, he can show us who he really is. And let's keep going with this because he's not done with this guy. In Matthew 19, verse 17, he starts... He goes here, he says, oh, I'm sorry, Richard, can you kind of set that back right? I, I hit the wrong one. Matthew 19, verse 17, it says, if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Oh, is it not there? All right, don't worry about it. I'll just read it to you. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones? He inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. So Jesus continues, after he corrects him for his version of good, he tells them some of the things he should be doing. Because you know, there are stuff that we should be doing. If we want to be close to Jesus, we got to do some stuff. All right. And he tells them to keep the commandments. And like a wise Jewish boy, he knew what Jesus was talking about, but he also knew that there are 613 commandments in the Old Testament. So when Jesus says, keep the commandments, is he saying, ooh, that's a tall order. 613 commandments in order to keep, in order to make it to heaven. I don't know about that. So like a wise man, he says, well, which ones? Maybe we can narrow the field. And to his relief, Jesus says only six of the Ten Commandments, not even all the Ten Commandments, just six of them. And this is super interesting because the ones that Jesus mentions are the ones that most human beings in the world know to do. They think, like, if you were to ask the standard person on the street, what are some things that you should be doing to be a good person? These commandments are probably in that field. Yeah. Right? We judge ourselves on these as kind of the minimum requirements. You know, like, I don't know if any of you have ever said this. I'm not perfect, but at least I haven't killed anyone. Right? That gets thrown out there. You say, well, you did say don't murder. So, okay, one down, five to go. Let's see how we're doing. None of these are really surprising. We know this stuff. Right? You shouldn't kill people. That's a bad thing. Okay, good. Got that nailed down. We're starting somewhere. Okay? Don't steal. Yeah, that one, that one makes a lot of sense. Don't take things that aren't yours. Right? Don't be a cheater. Don't cheat on your, on your insignificant other. Yeah, that's a good idea. You know, we don't like cheaters. Don't be a liar. Yeah, that's a good idea. Be, be someone that can be honest and truthful, right? Honor your father and mother, and you know, just overall love people. Be nice. None of these are shocking. These are all things that if we, if we ask the standard person what a good person would be, this would fall under those categories, right? Yeah. And when this guy heard this, I'm sure he was fired up. He's like, to get to heaven, I just got to do these six things? Well, Jesus. And Mark, it says, it says, all these I've kept since I was a boy. I'm wrapped up. I'm good. This was me when I started studying the Bible for the first time, for sure. I looked at my life, and I thought, you know what? I don't drink. I've never done drugs. I'm a virgin. 
I don't cuss. I must be good. I must be, I must, I, I'm, I'm at least meeting these six. And even now, you know, my nature is, as a human being, even now as somebody that wants to follow Jesus, my nature is to look for the minimum requirements to make God happy. You know, kind of what, what's the bare minimum I got to do for God to give me a pat on the back and then, and then, and then call it done? Because really what I want is I want to get the benefits of God. And when I really examine it, when I really look at my life and how I tend to want to credit myself, a lot of me wants to get credit for the stuff that I don't do. You know what I mean by that? I don't cheat on my wife. I don't swear. I don't fight people when I get physic physically when I get mad. You know, like all the things that I don't do, that, that at least I'm not doing these things. And it's funny because a relationship with God, and I think even sometimes Christianity as a whole, is the only place where we want to get credit for all the things we don't do. <laughs> like, could you ever imagine going to your boss and saying, hey, I want to raise because I didn't punch my coworker yesterday. <laughs> There's never a realm where that works outside of what we think God wants, right? But God, at least I haven't done this, 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 or this. And I'm not totally sure why Jesus shared these things and not the ones that he knew the guy really struggled with. Because what he didn't share with him is, you know, there's only one God and you've got to honor him. No idolatry. Don't put anything before him. But he starts with these. And after the man answers, after the man answers, okay, God, pff, Jesus, so I've, all these I've been keeping since I was a boy, I'm wrapped up. In Mark 21, I love this. Is that one not on there either? Man, I missed a bunch of things. I'm sorry, guys. No, oh, this is it. Never mind. I was right. There it is. It starts in verse 21 where it says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And I love this. This is different in the Mark account than any of the other three. That there's something about the connection here. I love that Jesus it says, even though what's about to happen next is, is pretty rough, that it's, it's coming from this place of Jesus saying, man, I really like you. I really love you, and I really hope you get this. I really want you to understand what I'm looking for. I really want you to know who I am and what I'm about and, and, and what life is really going to be. And from this place of love, from this place of, 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 of caring about this guy's salvation and his future, Jesus tells him something. He says, one thing you lack. He said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. What Jesus is telling him here, he says, look, there's one thing that you're missing. There's one thing in all this that you've neglected to really be honest about. Really what he's saying is there's one thing that's keeping you from everything. The Matthew account, the word that he uses, he says, there's one thing that's keeping you from being perfect. The Greek word there is, is it's mature, it's complete, it's not lacking anything. Now, was this literal? Did Jesus really mean this guy only has one problem that he needs to fix in order to make it to heaven? No. Do any of us just have one problem that we need to fix in order to make it to heaven? No, not a one of us. We're a bunch of problems. That's what we are. We are giant walking balls of problems. What he says here is he says, well, actually, what he doesn't kind of mention here is in Matthew 22, 37, one of the, the great commandments. He didn't bring this one up with him either. That really what, what Jesus, what God is always looking for, the greatest commandment, he says, I want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and strength. I want you to give me everything. I want you to love me with all your heart. He wasn't saying there's one thing you're missing. He's saying there's one thing that you're not giving me. There's one part of your heart that you are hanging on to. This is the one thing that would really keep you from giving yourself completely to me.
one thing you don't want to let go of, and it's the thing that's keeping you from really knowing me, and knowing me is the thing that's going to keep you from eternal life. The very thing you want, this is how you get it, and this is what's keeping you from it. And for this man, it was his wealth. It was his money. And I think, and I think with that, as anybody who has, has become a self-made person would know, man, it's the, it's the blood, the sweat, the tears, the energy, the time, the effort, all that you had put into making this possible, that's everything. And Jesus just said, give it all up. And really what he was looking for, I think, was he wanted, he wanted to keep all that, but get heaven on top of it. And this is not a passage where Jesus is telling us that money is evil. I don't want to look at it through that lens. And if you have money, you're not going to make it to heaven. What Jesus is saying here is that he wants all of us, not some of us. In Luke 14, 33, it says, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. There can't be one thing that we're holding back from Jesus and claiming that we're giving 99%. And really the truth of the matter is all of us have a one thing. And honestly, it may be more than one thing. It may be multiple one things. But we all have something that we don't completely want to give to God. It doesn't matter if this is your first time stepping into a church building or the thousandth time you've stepped into a church building. All of us have a one thing we don't want to let go of. It could be a relationship. It could be your job. It could be your money. It could be an addiction. It could be a pet sin that you have. It could be something that you've never really told anybody. Just something you've hung on to that you've never really been honest about. It could be shame. It could be regret. Could be a number of different things. There's a one thing for each and every one of us. For me, I had a deep rooted pride and addiction to pornography and impurity. When I really encountered Jesus for the first time, I had to come face to face with this in a way that I had never had to encounter before. I hated it, I hated having to see it. But most of all, I just hated it because I knew it was true. I knew it was wrong. I wanted it to change. I hated how prideful and insecure I was. That so much of my life had been about pleasing people and wanting people to think well of me. I hated how it felt when I was in purity, when I was in impurity. But I also didn't really want to give them up. I didn't really want to admit how wrong I really was, how much I really didn't know who Jesus was. I mean, how embarrassing, the minister's kid. He, is, he doesn't even have a clear picture of Jesus. Those are the kind of things that I told myself all the time. Even now as a 31-year-old man, I'm not removed from this. I still encounter this from time to time. But also on the other side of this, too, just to be perfectly honest with you, I was so addicted to pornography, I didn't know how I was going to adapt to the hurt and the pain of life without it. As much as I hated it, as much as I wanted it to change, that's how I dealt with life by that time. That's how I dealt with loneliness. That's how I dealt with fear. It's how I dealt with insecurity. It's how I dealt with any kind of disappointment or letdown in life was I medicated So the idea of just saying, I'm going to give up this crutch, I'm going to give up this thing that I've leaned on for so long to make me feel better about how crummy I felt about my life, I'm supposed to just give that to Jesus? But, the, but like I said, all of us have a one thing. And we all have to wrestle with giving it up if you really want to know Jesus. And sadly for this guy, his one thing wasn't worth it. 
When Jesus confronted him, when, when Jesus put it, put it out there and he said, look, this is the thing. This is the thing that will keep you from heaven. The very thing that you want. The Bible says he walked away sad. He walked away from Jesus because he didn't trust that a relationship with Jesus was worth more than his money. And what was interesting about this, what's interesting about this man is that compared to pretty much anyone else you read about in the Gospels, anybody that actually had a real encounter with Jesus, he's one of the only ones that encountered Jesus and was worse off when he left than when he got there. And he was in worse shape not because of Jesus, but because of himself. And because he wasn't willing to let go. He wanted Jesus to give him a stamp of approval. Atta boy. You've been doing it. I see you going to church every Sunday. Come on. God's waiting. What he really wanted was he wanted the promise of heaven without the need of following Jesus. He wanted the stuff of Jesus without the relationship with Jesus. And as this man walked away, and this is, this is to me one of the most tragic stories in the Gospels. Tragic. Because here he was, he seemed to be on the right track. He had, you know, if we take him literally at this, he was 99% of the way there, and it was that 1% that he couldn't let go of. But as this man is walking away, it says that Jesus looks over at the crowd. He doesn't chase him. He doesn't, go, he doesn't go running after him going, no, wait, come back. You're almost there. He lets him go. Which is the truth of the matter for all of us. If we're not ready to give it all up for God, Jesus is not just going to come chasing us to make us do it. If you want to walk away, the door's right there. Nobody's going to stop you. What he does do is he turns to the crowd and he says some powerful words. In Matthew 19, 23, he says, Truly I tell you, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. When Jesus says this, he's not talking about physical wealth. Well, only physical wealth. He uses a Greek word, plusios. And what it means is it's somebody that has more than they need. This can be money, possessions, or even spiritual virtue. It's anyone who looks at their life and thinks that what they have is good enough. If you think that you have enough financially, spiritually, physically, then it's going to be hard to enter the kingdom of God because you don't see how much you really need Jesus. And this is a battle. We are very, very wealthy people in the United States. I found this website that it, I can't remember, it was like the, the rich list or something like that, that if you type in your, your net income, it tells you where you compare to the rest of the world. And I typed in just, just, just for fun, I was like, oh, I'm going to try this out, $50,000 a year. It says you are in the top 0.321% of all people in the world for wealth. Let that sink in. $50,000 is not even like a lot by, by an American standard. And you're richer than more than 99% of people on this earth. So financially, we are wealthy. But more than that, we got enough stuff. We got a lot of people around. We got social media at every turn. We, we got enough to tell us that we got enough. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus is actually challenging a church there, and he's trying to help us with this perspective. And he says, look, you say that I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. He says, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And again, this isn't just about the physical wealth. This isn't about how much is in your checking account. What Jesus is saying, look, if you just tell yourself, you know what, I'm doing enough. I got enough friends. 
I got a comfy house, place to live. You know, I don't have all the money that I want, but I got enough money. You know, I go to church most of the time. I'm good enough. If you tell yourself that, then what he's saying is you're missing out on the big picture. That really you're poor. You got nothing. You in and of yourself, you have nothing. And after the man leaves, everyone with Jesus is freaking out, thinking that they're doomed. Maybe even like some of you are feeling right now. You're feeling pretty hopeless. You feel like, Jake, this is supposed to, you're supposed to be leading me to Jesus, and, you, and you're just, like, just totally wrecking me right now. That's okay. Matter of fact, it's probably a good thing. But Jesus says something very powerful here as we kind of get to closing out this story. Verse 26, he looks to this crowd, this crowd that's in a panic, because they're saying, man, if this guy can't get it, then how are we going to get it? He says, Jesus looked at them, and said, it is impossible for people to save themselves. But everything is possible for God. Jesus was trying to get them all to see that if they really knew him, if they were closely following him, everything was possible. Everything that they needed in life, it was all possible, including eternal life. You can't get there on your own. It's impossible for you to save yourself, but I can save you. You might feel like a lost cause. You might, there might be something in this to go, that one thing is too hard to overcome. Jesus is saying, look, by yourself, yeah, it is. You can't do this. On my own, I've fought that battle for years and years and years, thinking, thinking I'll, I'll fix this. I'll, I'll fix my problem with pornography, and it didn't get better. It's not until you turn in. Throw your hands up. Say, okay, look, clearly I'm not doing it. Jesus, whatever you want. He says, that, that's when all things are possible. The answer to this guy's question, the question of what do I got to do, the answer was a real relationship with Jesus. Jesus. Not a good deed checklist. Not a make sure you've done all this and then God's going to ask you when you got up there, he's going to check your passport and make sure it's all good to go. Because the truth is, none of us are good enough to get it on our own. Your version of good, it's not good enough. Your version of good deeds, it's not good enough. You can't. He can't. And if you're visiting with us, what's amazing about, about this story here, what Jesus uses the sadness of this man to tell the rest of the crowd that he wanted to have a relationship with him, is that Jesus wants to be part of your story. All of us have a story. But part of what we've got to do is we've got to abandon our notion of who we think Jesus is in that. Start from scratch. Your version maybe of going to church as you grew up, your version of what you saw on TV, your version of what you maybe even experienced with people who say that they're Christians, just, just erase it all. Start from zero. Study the Bible. Talk to somebody that invited you out. Get a chance to really encounter Jesus for real. If you're here right now and this is your first time at church or this is your first time in a long time, this is a great first step. But Jesus is waiting to rewrite your story. To give you something victorious. To give you something, you know, we, we don't know what happened to this guy. I like to believe that somewhere down the lines this guy got it. We don't know. But there are a lot of other people that when they did encounter Jesus, when they really saw him for who he was, it changed everything about them for the rest of their lives. That's what Jesus wants to do for you, but it's not going to be because you showed up to church. It's not because you're good enough. It's not because you know the words of the songs. None of that stuff is it. It's about you really getting to know who Jesus is on a real level. Love you guys so much. Thank you.